Welcome back. With this web lecture, we're beginning a new unit in your book, and we're going to be thinking now about genes and gene expression. So in this web lecture, we're going to first of all start thinking about the history of the discovery of DNA as the genetic material, as the molecular basis of inheritance. How do we know what we know about how DNA works? And then we're going to think in more detail about the structure and function relationships with DNA, what it is about the structure of the DNA molecule that makes it ideal for functioning as a template for its own replication. And then we'll go into the details of DNA replication, how it works, how mistakes are fixed, and then finally how DNA is packaged to control the amount of transcription that can occur at any particular gene. So as we know, DNA is both the storehouse and also the instruction book for all of the instructions for how to grow and operate an organism. So in 1953, James Watson and Francis Crick introduced an elegant double helical model for the structure of deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. So we know now that hereditary information is encoded in DNA and it's reproduced in every cell of the body. Every cell has the exact same set of instructions and as we saw in the cell signaling chapter, the part of that instruction book that's used depends a lot on the signals any individual cell receives. This DNA program is going to direct the development of biochemical, anatomical, physiological, and even to some extent behavioral traits. So this is that link between genotype, the particular sequence of DNA you possess, and phenotype, all of these outward expressions of those genes. DNA is copied during DNA replication. Remember, this happens during the S phase of the cell cycle. And cells have the machinery in place to repair their DNA when mistakes in replication happen. So how do we know that DNA is the genetic material? How did we come to this conclusion historically? Early in the 20th century, the identification of the molecules of inheritance loomed as a major challenge to biologists. Why is it that offspring tend to resemble their parents? What is the basis for inheritance? Researchers had already established that chromosomes were composed of DNA and protein. We'll go back in BCOR12 and learn about the chromosome theory of inheritance, but scientists at this time come to understand that chromosomes were the units that were passed down from parent to offspring that were the basis for inheritance. So we knew that chromosomes were responsible for inheritance. They knew that chromosomes were composed of DNA and protein. But what are the genes made of? What is the actual stuff that determines how offspring resemble their parents? So are genes made of DNA or are they made of protein? What is the actual genetic material? So at the time, the smart money was on proteins. Most biologists thought genes were made of proteins. Why? Um, remember that there is a huge amount of complexity to proteins between the primary structure, the different sequences of amino acids that are possible, and the complex uh, secondary and tertiary structures they can take, the complex shapes that they can take. This was thought to be much more likely to be the basis for the huge amount of variability that we see in phenotype in organisms. So by comparison, DNA is composed of only four different nucleotides. It seemed at the time to provide less basis for a huge amount of variation, the kind of variation that would produce all of the organismal diversity that you see. It seemed more likely to be proteins at the time. That was until some experiments done by Hershey and Chase the Hershey Chase experiment provided evidence that, in fact, it was DNA and not protein that was the genetic material. So and these came from studies of viruses that infect bacteria. So these viruses are called bacteriophages, usually just called phages for short, and these are very widely used in molecular genetics research. You'll see this over and over and over again as you go through your biology education. A virus is basically just a unit of DNA, or sometimes RNA, that's enclosed in a protective coat that's often simply just a protein coat. 
Hershey and Chase studied how the T2 virus infects the bacterium Escherichia coli, better known as E. coli. So the T2 infection of E. coli begins when the virus injects its genes into the cell. These genes direct production of new virus particles. So this is the basis for reproducing itself. We know that whatever is injected into that cell is the genetic material. This is what's going to allow replication of these viruses. The virus's protein coat, or the capsid, is left behind on the outside of the cell. So what enters the cell, protein or DNA? So here's an image of how this virus works. The capsid attaches to the surface of the E. coli cell, and it basically just spews its genetic material into the cell. It then uses the cellular machinery of the bacterium to replicate itself. It does not have the biochemical pathways it needs to be able to replicate the DNA. So it actually uses the bacteria's DNA replication machinery to replicate itself and to produce new capsid coats, new protein coats, and then the bacteria bacteria lyses and releases those copies of the virus, and this is how viruses reproduce. So in this experiment, the experimenters exposed different populations of viruses to radio-labeled components of either DNA in one group or radioactive components of proteins in another group. And then they are allowed to infect bacteria, so they're, they are injecting their DNA into the bacterium, leaving the capsids outside and the genes inside. So then they take these infected cells and centrifuge them so that what's inside the cell ends up in the pellet at the bottom, what's outside the cell in solution ends up in the solution uh, above the pellet, and all we need to do now is see if the glowing stuff is in the pellet or in the solution. So in the population where the DNA was radiolabeled, we find the radioactivity in the pellet, which means that this is what's inside the cell. In the population in which the protein is radiolabeled, we find the radiolabeling in the solution, which means the protein was left outside the cell. It's actually the DNA that enters the cell and is the basis for the replication of the viruses. So this is some strong evidence that, in fact, it's DNA and not protein that is the basis for inheritance. So we know that DNA is a polymer of nucleotides, each consisting of a nitrogenous base, a sugar, and a phosphate group. And this has been known for quite a long time. At the time, they knew that the nitrogenous bases can be adenine, thymine, guanine, or cytosine. And in 1950, a scientist named Erwin Shargoff reported that DNA composition varies from one species to the next. So this is an indication that the amount of variability necessary to create organismal diversity is possible, at least, with DNA. The fact that it can vary between different species means that there's enough variability possible in the different combinations of DNA. So this evidence of diversity made DNA a more credible candidate for the genetic material. And there were two findings from his work that became known as Shargoff's rules. So first of all, as we just mentioned, the base composition of DNA varies between species. And then also he found that in any species, the number of A and T bases is equal to each other. You have the same amount of A and T, and you have the same amount of G and C. So this is a very interesting finding, but really it wasn't until we knew something more about the structure of the DNA molecule that this really made any sense. So at the time, this was an interesting pattern that was in need of an explanation. So that explanation came with the discovery of the structure of DNA. So after DNA was accepted as the genetic material, now what we really need to find out is how its structure can account for its role in heredity. How does it gain enough variability to account for biodiversity? And how does it allow for the transmission of information from one generation to the next? Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin were conducting um, experiments trying to create images of the molecular structure. They were using a technique called X-ray crystallography that produced images of molecules. And Franklin produced a picture of the DNA molecule using this technique. 
And it was really these images that allowed Watson to deduce the helical shape of the DNA. In addition, the X-ray images also enabled Watson to make measurements of the dimensions of these molecules. So he was able to deduce the width of the helix and also the spacing between the nitrogenous bases. So the pattern in the photo suggested that the DNA molecule was made up of two strands forming a double helix. So then Watson and Crick together began building models of a double helix using both what they knew about the structure from the imaging produced by Rosalind Franklin and also what they knew about the chemistry of DNA. They knew something about the hydrogen bonding and the rules of how all of these molecular components need to be connected together. So they put those things together to create this model. So Franklin had already concluded based on her imaging that there were two outer sugar phosphate backbones. So those form the helix and the nitrogenous bases were paired in the molecule's interior. So previous models had speculated that the nitrogenous bases were sticking out from the sugar backbone. Her images showed that they were actually facing in toward each other in the interior. So the way Watson made this work was by building a model in which the backbones were anti-parallel. That was the only way to make the model consistent with both the images and the way they knew the chemistry worked. And so their subunits run in opposite directions to each other. At first, Watson and Crick thought the bases paired like with like, so A with A, and so on. But then they knew from the images that the width of this helix was constant. It was uniform throughout. The like with like pairing did not result in a uniform width in the double helix, so that was not their solution. Instead, pairing a purine, A or G, with a pyrimidine, C or T, resulted in a uniform width consistent with the x-ray data, and we saw this image before when we were looking at the chapter on nucleic acids, where we see that if you put two purines together because they've got that double ring that makes it too wide. This, these lines uh, show the limits for that uniform width that was observed in the x-ray crystallography images. A pyrimidine with a pyrimidine ends up being too narrow. You would have the sort of bending in of the molecule if you had them paired together. But a purine with a pyrimidine created a constant width that was consistent with that x-ray data. So finally, Watson and Crick ended up reasoning out that the pairing had to be more specific than just pairing with pyrimidine. We had a specific bases that paired only with other bases, and that gave rise to the rule that we all know very well at this point, that adenine pairs only with thymine, and that guanine pairs only with cytosine. So the Watson and Crick model explains Shargoff's rules very, very nicely. You would always have equal amounts of A and T because an A always has to pair with a T and vice versa, and you'd always have equal amounts of G and C because G always pairs with a C. So that was a very nice explanation of that previous observation. So let's quickly review the primary structure of DNA. We learned about this in the earlier chapter on nucleic acids, but it's going to be important again when we come to DNA replication, so I just want to refresh your memory. So the backbone consists of the sugar deoxyribose along with the phosphate groups that are going to link them all together, and then also a series of nitrogen-containing bases, the A, T, G, and C, that are going to be connected to this backbone of sugars. And recall that DNA has directionality. There's a three prime end that has an exposed hydroxyl group attached to the three prime carbon. Remember the carbons are numbered. One, two, three, four, and five is the one that's outside the ring. And this is the three prime carbon that has the hydroxyl group attached to it. And then the five prime carbon has an exposed phosphate group attached to it. So three prime end, five prime end, the five prime refers to the carbon that is exposed at the end with the phosphate group. In this case, it's the five prime carbon. In this case, it's the three prime carbon. The secondary structure is also going to be really important when we come to DNA replication, so let's review that also very quickly. So Watson and Crick proposed that two DNA strands line up in opposite directions to each other in anti-parallel fashion. So here we have five prime to three prime on this strand and three prime to five prime on the other strand running in opposite directions. 
and that these anti-parallel strands form a double helix, so they're going to twist around each other. And this secondary structure, this anti-parallel structure with a twist, is going to be stabilized by the base pairing. So remember that there are hydrogen bonds between these A's and T's and G's and C's that are going to stabilize them together and keep them hooked together. So now let's think about this actual replication of the DNA. How is it that this structure makes DNA so perfect for being able to replicate itself, for being a template for its own replication? So this is probably the best example that we have in all of biology of that beautiful relationship between structure and function. And it was actually the discovery of the structure that suggested this function immediately to Watson and Crick. So Watson and Crick noted that the specific base pairing suggested immediately a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. So because of complementary base pairing, the existing strands of DNA can be separated from each other and serve as a template, the pattern, for the production of new strands. So here we have the parent molecule, if we just pull it apart and then add new nitrogenous bases, the two resulting strands are going to be identical to that original strand. So perfect for acting as a template for its own replication. But how exactly does this happen? So there were three hypotheses at the time for how these parental strands and daughter strands act during replication. So these three hypotheses are the semi-conservative replication, conservative, and dispersive replication. In conservative replication, the parental molecule is going to serve as a template for an entirely new molecule. So you could envision this as the two strands separate, one of them constructs one of the strands for the new DNA molecule, then that is released, and then that one is the template for the other strand. The two original parental strands come back together, and we have the original parental DNA left intact and an entirely new daughter DNA. In semi-conservative replication, parental strands separate and each one is a template for a new strand. So that means each daughter DNA is going to have one old and one new strand. The final model was dispersive replication in which the parent molecule is basically just chopped up into sections and replicated piecemeal. And so in the daughter molecules, you'd have this kind of combination of old and new bits that were synthesized in a piecemeal way, and that is going to be retained through subsequent replications. This gives rise to a specific hypothesis that can be tested, right? What do we find in terms of the original DNA molecules, the original strands, when we get down to the second generation? So this lends itself very nicely to an experiment in which a population of E. coli was grown for many generations in a medium in which the only source of nitrogen is a heavy isotope of nitrogen. So basically the bacteria are grown in this culture for enough generations so that all of their DNA has only this heavy nitrogen in it, nitrogen 15. Then a sample of these bacteria with the heavy nitrogen DNA is put into a growth medium with normal nitrogen, the nitrogen 14. After the cells are allowed to divide once, a sample is taken, we measure the density of the DNA in that sample, and then we transfer another sample again to a growth medium with just nitrogen 14 and let them divide again for a second generation. And so here are our predictions. So we're gonna centrifuge these samples, we're gonna separate the DNA by density and compare. So what is our prediction for semi conservative replication. In the first generation, all of them will be intermediate weight because all of them are made of one strand of the heavy nitrogen and one strand with the normal nitrogen. If the red is the normal density nitrogen and the gray is the heavy nitrogen, every single DNA strand is going to be half and half. If conservative replication is correct, then you would have two different bands, one with the heavy nitrogen and one with the light nitrogen, and there should be half and half of each of these. But in terms of dispersive replication, the prediction for the first generation is pretty much the same as for the semi-conservative. You're gonna have half and half light and heavy in each of those daughter DNA molecules. So one generation doesn't allow you to distinguish between these two hypotheses but the second generation does. So the prediction in the second generation 
is that these strands, these light and heavy strands are still intact. So in the second generation, what you're gonna get is half of them with a heavy and a light strand. So these two that have one of these heavy strands from this original parental generation, and then two that are just the light nitrogen. So you're gonna have two different weights, an intermediate band with just these two mixed molecules with a heavy and a light strand, and then a light band that just has both of the strands with the light form of nitrogen. The prediction for conservative replication is that you'd have one heavy molecule for every three light molecules. So you'd have two bands, one heavy and one light, and there should be about three times as much of the light as the heavy. But now for the dispersive model, you would expect that all of the DNA strands would have an intermediate density. There would only be one band kind of in the middle showing this hodgepodge of cobbled together DNA molecules in the dispersive model. So what do we find? In generation zero, we have all heavy. That's confirming that we do have nothing but the heavy nitrogen in this parental generation. In generation one, there's one band of intermediate weight, just what we would expect here or here. If this were true, we'd see a heavy band and a light band. Okay, that's not what we see, so we can rule out conservative. And then for the second generation, we see an intermediate weight band and a light band, about equal amounts of both, which is exactly what we would predict in semi-conservative. If it were dispersive, what we would see is, again, exactly the same thing that we saw in generation one. All of them at an intermediate weight is what we would expect for dispersive replication. So this experiment provides evidence for the semi-conservative model of replication. So let's take a closer look at how this works. So the copying of DNA is absolutely remarkable in its speed and accuracy. And many, many enzymes and other proteins are gonna participate in DNA replication. Replication is gonna begin at particular sites called origins of replication, where the two DNA strands separate from each other, opening up what's called a replication bubble. A eukaryotic chromosome, remember eukaryotes have linear chromosomes. It may have hundreds or even thousands of origins of replication all replicating that DNA simultaneously. It's very fast and efficient. In prokaryotes, you generally have one replication bubble and it moves all the way around that circular DNA until you've got two circular copies. And replication proceeds in both directions from each origin. So you can imagine that replication bubble getting bigger and bigger and bigger until the entire molecule is copied. Each replication bubble has two replication forks. This is the point at which the two DNA strands separate from each other, so there's gonna be one at either end of that replication bubble. So here's what that might look like. First, in a eukaryotic organism, the DNA is unzipping one strand from each other. Remember, these are going in opposite directions from each other, so the DNA is being replicated in the five prime to three prime direction on both of these strands. And here is an actual image of this happening, the DNA bubble, where the DNA is being replicated as this DNA molecule separates and opens up. So here's an example in a eukaryotic chromosome. So remember, this is just a line, so it's got ends at either side, and this has multiple replication bubbles, making that replication of the eukaryotic DNA much faster. Replication is happening in both directions, from in the five prime to three prime direction. So for, let's first think about how that helix is opened up. How do we get the separation of these strands and what keeps it from just zipping back together again? So several proteins are responsible for opening and stabilizing the double helix. First is a molecule called DNA helicase, which breaks the hydrogen bonds between the two DNA strands to separate them. So that molecule is represented here. It's going through and breaking those hydrogen bonds between the nitrogenous bases. But remember that these bases are attracted to each other by these partial charges on them that create the hydrogen bonds, so we need to make sure that they don't just zip right back together again. That is the job of single-strand DNA binding proteins, SSBPs, that are going to attach to the separated strands to keep them from just snapping back together again. So this unwinding of the DNA helix creates tension farther down the helix. Imagine um, unwinding the helix and then beyond that, 
the rest of the helix has to tighten a little bit, and that's not good for the molecule. It can make it break. So what we have is another enzyme topoisomerase that's going to cut the DNA, let it unwind a little bit, and join it back together to relieve the tension. So the new strand of DNA is synthesized by an enzyme called DNA polymerase. So DNA polymerase works only in the five prime to three prime direction. The easiest way I think to think about this is to remember that new monomers, new nucleotides are only going to be added to the three prime end where that exposed hydroxyl group is. That's where it's going to create that phosphodiester bond only on the three prime end of the molecule. The other thing about DNA polymerase is that it can't start a new strand. All it can do is add the nucleotides onto the end of an existing strand. So we need something to help it get started. We need to give it an end to work from. And this is done by a short primer made of RNA that is produced by an enzyme called primase. So primase base pairs with the DNA template strand, so it's going to do that complementary base pairing, but it, all, but it doesn't require a starter. It can just pair those bases together and leave them there for DNA polymerase to start working on. So these enzymes are called DNA polymerases and they're going to catalyze the synthesis of new DNA at a replication fork. So again, most of these DNA polymerases require both a primer, that RNA primer, so that they have something to attach to, and also the DNA template strand to give them the complementary base pairs to add. Each nucleotide that's added to a growing DNA strand is a nucleoside triphosphate. We call this DNTP, where the N stands for either A, T, G, or C. So for example, DATP, supplies adenine to DNA, and it's similar to the ATP that we know lots about from energy metabolism. The only difference is that the sugar is a deoxyribose instead of a ribose, and so these molecules are also high energy molecules that supply the energy as well as the nitrogenous base. As each monomer joins the DNA strand by a dehydration reaction, make sure you remember what dehydration reactions are. If you go all the way back to when we first started talking about polymers, they were pretty much all formed by these dehydration reactions. In that process, it loses two phosphate groups as a molecule of pyrophosphate. So this is what this looks like. We're adding new bases. This is our nucleoside triphosphate with the three phosphate groups attached to the nucleoside with the coming to join on to the exposed hydroxyl group of the three prime end of the existing strand. We're going to get rid of two inorganic phosphates in the form of pyrophosphate that's going to be converted to two inorganic phosphates. This is also a dehydration reaction, so it's not shown here, but we're also going to lose a molecule of water. So the fact of this anti-parallel structure of the double helix is going to have an effect on its replication. So remember that DNA polymerases add nucleotides only to the free three prime end of a growing strand. So it's going to attach it here at the three prime end. And so therefore a new DNA strand can elongate only in the five prime to three prime direction. But remember that this replication happens in both directions. So along one template strand of DNA, the DNA polymerase synthesizes a leading strand continuously, and that's going to be moving toward the replication fork. So you can imagine the DNA polymerase just moving right along here, and it's going to stay here and just polymerize that as the fork opens up and that strand is exposed. And so that's going to be on both strands, but the leading strands are going to be going in opposite directions. So there's going to be a leading strand here going toward this replication fork, from the origin of replication, and also on the other strand, there's going to be a leading strand that's moving toward the other replication fork. But it's going to need to replicate the rest of this strand also. It can't just keep going in that direction and not replicate the rest of it as it opens up. So we also have a lagging strand. And to create this other strand, remember it still has to go in the same direction, but it's working in the direction away from the replication forks. So that means that it needs to work in small fragments as this replication fork opens up and exposes more DNA to copy. 
So these little fragments are called Okazaki fragments, and they're eventually, when they reach each other, going to be joined together by another enzyme called DNA ligase that's going to stitch them together when they reach the previous fragment. So let's take a look at what this continuous strand synthesis looks like, um, the leading strand. So very simply, we've got a primase at the origin of replication that's going to synthesize the primer, and then the helix being opened up by helicase. We've got these single-strand DNA binding proteins that are going to keep those two strands separated from each other. We see this kind of kinking and tight winding of the DNA just behind the helicase being unwound um, and having that tension released by topoisomerase, which is going to basically cut the molecule, let it unwind, and rejoin it. And in the second step of synthesis, a DNA polymerase is going to use that primer as a starting point and start adding nucleotides to the three prime end of that primer. And it's gonna continue adding new nucleotides to the three prime end, moving toward the replication fork and just adding nucleotides as it goes. Very easy, very simple, and continuous. So now let's take a closer look at this lagging strand elongation, the replication of the lagging strand. So here is the origin of replication. This is the primer for the leading strand, so this is moving, working toward that replication fork in this direction. There's another replication fork in this direction, and we're working away from the second replication fork on the other side of the bubble. So first, we get a primase creating an RNA primer, creating that three prime end for DNA polymerase to add on to. So DNA polymerase joins up with that primer fragment and starts polymerizing DNA toward the original primer from the leading strand. It's going to complete the DNA replication away from its replication fork, which is off in the three prime direction. So it's gonna go five prime to three prime until it meets up with the RNA primer from that original leading strand going in the other direction and complete that DNA replication when it gets to the primer. Next, a new primer is going to be added farther upstream toward the replication fork and DNA polymerase is then going to add nucleotides along here of, of DNA until it reaches that original primer. Meanwhile, these primers are being replaced by another form of DNA polymerase called DNA polymerase 1. But DNA polymerase 1 is going to replace those RNA primers with DNA so that the entire strand is DNA with no RNA in it. And then finally, a DNA ligase is going to join these fragments together, creating those phosphodiester bonds uh, where the two strands join together zipping this all together into a perfectly good, complete DNA strand, and that process will continue as that replication bubble opens up more and more segments. We're gonna keep adding those little fragments in the same way. So this is known as the discontinuous replication hypothesis, the idea that primase synthesizes new RNA primers on the lagging strand as that replication fork opens. The DNA polymerase 3 is going to synthesize these short little fragments of DNA along the lagging strand, always adding to the 3 prime end, going from 5 prime to 3 prime. And then the fragments are then going to be linked together into a continuous strand. So this hypothesis was confirmed by a Japanese biologist by the name of Okazaki, so they are known as Okazaki fragments in his honor. So this is just another sort of more comprehensive view of how this all works. This has both strands working together. It shows the opening up of the DNA molecule. The leading strand is sort of faded out so you can concentrate on the lagging strand, but you can also see how this leading strand is just being continuously produced. So here we have an Okazaki fragment getting started with a primer synthesizing in the five prime to three prime direction. And as it's finishing up and meeting up with the previous Okazaki fragment, a new primer is added, a new DNA polymerase three is gonna start replicating toward that first fragment. When we get to the first fragment, DNA polymerase one replaces the RNA with DNA. And then finally DNA ligase closes that gap and joins those two fragments together. Meanwhile, 
more segments are being created in the same way. But we run into a problem when we get to the ends of these linear chromosomes that we have in eukaryotes. So remember, prokaryotes have a circular chromosome. They're not going to end up having this end problem. And this is the result of this discontinuous replication on the lagging strand. So the very ends of these linear chromosomes are known as telomeres. And here's the problem. So the leading strand is synthesized all the way to the end. Remember, this is continuous. It's got its three prime end to add to all the way as it goes along. But on the lagging strand, we need that RNA primer. And you can never get all the way to the end. You're going to run out of room to attach that RNA primer. So the final Okazaki fragment is going to be made. The primer is going to be removed, and it's going to leave this little end of the template that DNA can't polymerize anymore because there's no primer to, to get it started. So we end up with a single-stranded piece of DNA left at the very end of the lagging strand. And this single-stranded DNA is eventually degraded. So as this continues, this is going to shorten the chromosome by 50 to 100 nucleotides each time replication occurs. So this is a problem. So over time, linear chromosomes would just vanish away if this were not if this problem were not solved in some way. So evolution has resulted in telomeres, these ends that don't actually contain any genes. So to some extent, some of that genetic material is just expendable. It can just degrade away, but there needs to be some way of regenerating it uh, so that those chromosomes don't completely disappear over time. So here's a visual representation of this problem. This is the end of the chromosome. Uh, with the leading strand, no problem. The DNA polymerase is just going to go all the way to the very end, adding to the three prime end and going to completion. So here we have the lagging strand that's adding primers. Here's that last primer that's being added close to the end. That last Okazaki fragment is going to be synthesized and then there's nowhere for another primer to attach to be able to replicate this last little end, which means that this is left as RNA. So this whole little fragment is going to basically come off and be degraded because it's not going to be replicated by DNA. So now we've got a lagging strand that's too short. So this problem is solved in some cells by an enzyme called telomerase. So the enzyme telomerase is going to add some material to the ends of those telomeres using an RNA template. So here is our missing DNA on the lagging strand. It hasn't been completely replicated. So telomerase is going to have its own RNA template and it's going to match up with, with the unpaired end of this template DNA. And it's got an additional template that's going to add some nucleotides to that template strand. And they're going to be very specific, non-coding, um, right, because these ends need to be somewhat expendable. And so it's going to add, add DNA nucleotides to the end of this template strand so that there's room for a primer to be added and for the rest of that template strand to be replicated. Um, there's still going to be an end, but remember this is new that was created by the telomerase, and so it's okay that that just degrades away. So that extended single strand of DNA is going to act as a template to finish that, that fragment. So telomerase exists in germ cells, the cells that are going to give rise to gametes, which is why we have gametes that can be reproduced indefinitely to produce the continuity of life through all of the billions of years that life has existed. Um, but somatic cells, the normal cells that make up the rest of your body that are not non-gamete cells, normally lack telomerase. So chromosomes of somatic cells progressively shorten. These telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter with every cell division. And this occurs as the individual ages. So this is being looked into as a potential uh, mechanism that causes aging in organisms. So a scientist named Greider proposed that the number of cell divisions is limited by the initial length of a cell's telomeres. It's just going to divide until the telomere is gone, and then it can't divide anymore. So once chromosomes are shortened to a threshold length, further divisions are shut down. So some support for this idea um, is given by 
experiments done in culture in which the telomere length correlates to the number of cell divisions the cell is going to undergo. And we find that if we add telomerase to cells in culture, that's going to allow them to continue dividing beyond that limit. And we also know that most cancer cells have active telomerase. So this is again going to get by that limit to the number of cell divisions and allow these cancer cells to divide in an unregulated way and produce tumors. So it's possible that inhibiting telomerase could slow or stop cancer so at this point, I want to give you a um, memorization alert. So you are going to need to commit to memory the names and functions of these different proteins that are involved in DNA replication. And I've given you a couple of different ways to organize this. Uh, this is a chart from your textbook that just gives you a list of the different enzymes that are necessary for replication and a list of their functions. Um, this is from another textbook that has them grouped by the different phases of replication, and so these are the enzymes relating to opening up the helix. These are the enzymes that relate to leading strand DNA synthesis, and these are the enzymes involved in the lagging strand synthesis. So that might be another way that you could organize this material to help you commit it to memory. So these we're going to expect you to know and remember the names of the enzymes and what they do. And so all of these enzymes work together, obviously, but it's now thought that they actually are connected to each other in one of these molecular machines. So remember that um, enzymes can, can actually form a complex so that they are combined together, they're connected together in a particular way that allows them to all work together as a single machine, and we call this machine the replosome. So the proteins that participate in DNA replication form a large complex. We can think of this as a DNA replication machine. This is one possible configuration for such a machine. Um, the book gives you a different configuration, and it's now thought that this replication machine, this complex of enzymes, actually stays in place and actually feeds the DNA molecule through it rather than we usually think of this polymerase kind of moving along the, the DNA molecule, but it's possible that all of these enzymes kind of stay in place, stay in the same place relative to each other, and that the DNA molecule actually moves through it kind of like replication factory. So recent studies support this model where the DNA polymerase molecules reel in parental DNA and extrude the newly made daughter molecules. Think of this as something going through a conveyor belt in a factory, right? This is the big replication machine and these inputs are coming in and the outputs are leaving. Uh, but the exact mechanism and the exact configuration of this machine uh, is not yet worked out. So this is why you see this possible configuration, this possible mechanism, you see a different possible configuration in your textbook. We haven't quite worked out all the details of this yet. So now let's think about what happens when DNA synthesis is not completely accurate. So most of the time it's very accurate. Why? Because that base pairing is, is specific, right? There's going to be a higher affinity for the correct base pairing partners than for other molecules. It's already got a mechanism for correct replication. Um, but mistakes are made. So the error rate is about one mistake per billion bases, which is not very much, but it does happen if you think of all of the DNA and all of the cells and all the organisms in the world replicating their DNA over and over and over again through time. Um, that's a lot of total mistakes. So DNA polymerase matches bases with high accuracy. Why? Because the correct base pairings are the most energetically favorable. Remember, we've got those um, hydrogen bonds that are very specific. And the correct base pairs have a distinct shape. Remember, we're maintaining that constant width of the two sugar backbones and any alteration to that. Um, is going to give it a different shape. But every once in a while, during replication, an incorrect base is going to be inserted, and that happens about once every 100,000 bases. But there are repair enzymes and other mechanisms that are going to remove defective bases and replace them with the correct one. And this is the proofreading mechanism. So DNA polymerase itself is going to proofread its own work. 
Again, mismatched bases have this distinct shape. They're not going to be the correct width. They're going to create a little bump or a little indentation in this um, strand. And so when that incorrect shape is detected by DNA polymerase, then it's not going to add the next nucleotide until that last one is corrected. So this is not going to join on unless this is a nice straight even width line. That's sort of the first line of defense is that the DNA polymerase is just not going to continue until the right base is added on there. So if the enzyme finds a mismatch, its epsilon subunit removes the mismatched base, so there's a subunit on the enzyme itself. Um, it's going to kick that one out and then put the right one in. So this proofreading process reduces the error rate to about one mistake in 10 million base pairs. So that's an improvement. But still, mistakes happen. So then we have another mechanism called mismatch repair. So if the DNA polymerase actually leaves that wonky shape in place, it's going to leave that mismatched pair behind. And so this is going to be repaired when mismatched bases are corrected after DNA synthesis is complete. And what's going to happen is there are going to be special enzymes, mismatch repair enzymes, that are going to detect that um, altered shape. They're going to recognize the mismatched pair, and they're just going to remove that section of the new strand. So this is just going to be taken out and then fill in the correct basis. So there's a nuclease is the enzyme that's going to remove that section, and then another DNA polymerase is going to come in and fill in those missing nucleotides, adding to the three prime end and working five prime to three prime. And then finally, again, DNA ligase is going to join that gap in the strand, creating those phosphodiester bonds into a continuous strand of DNA. But even with all of these repair mechanisms, mistakes are still made. The error rate after proofreading and repair is low, but it's not zero. But this is really important to the process of evolution. So these sequence changes may become permanent and can be passed on to the next generation. If this happens in germ cells that are going to become gametes, these mistakes can be passed along. And this is what we call mutations, changes in the DNA sequence. And these are the source of the genetic variation upon which natural selection operates and are ultimately responsible for the appearance of, over time, new species. So remember, always remember, that natural selection works on standing genetic variation. Natural selection cannot create anything new. Mutation is the only source of new features in this whole evolutionary process. So these mutations are incredibly important to generating genetic variation and mutations generate the variation and the natural selection selects the most favorable variants. So mutations arise by chance, natural selection matches those variations to the particular environment an organism lives in. So finally I want to think a little bit about the structure of these chromosomes as they exist in the nucleus. Um, how they're packed together with proteins, and this is going to become very important when we get to gene expression because the way the chromosomes are packed together with the proteins is going to determine whether the molecules necessary for the expression of genes are actually going to physically have access to the gene to express them. So the bacterial chromosome, remember, is a double-stranded circular DNA molecule associated with just a small amount of proteins. So eukaryotic chromosomes, remember, have linear DNA, and these are going to be associated with a large amount of protein. And this protein is going to determine the specific way in which the chromosomes are packed in the nucleus. So in a bacterium, the DNA is supercoiled, so it's going to be condensed down um, into this coiled structure, and it's going to be found in a region of the cell called the nucleoid. Remember, prokaryotes don't have a nucleus, a membrane-bound nucleus. So in the eukaryotic cell, DNA is combined in a very precise way with proteins, and together the DNA and the proteins are referred to as chromatin. So chromosomes fit into the nucleus through an elaborate multi-level system of packing of the DNA along with these proteins. So the proteins 
uh, are primarily proteins called histones that are going to be responsible for the first level of packing in chromatin. So unfolded chromatin resembles beads on a string, with each bead being a nucleosome, which is the basic unit of DNA packaging. So a nucleosome is composed of two of each of the four basic histone types. So we've got eight total histone molecules bunched together with DNA wrapped twice around it. Okay, so there's a core of eight histones and two wraps around. This reminds me of knitting. Um, Got to wrap twice and now you have a nucleosome. So the end termini, the tails of the histones, protrude from the nucleosome. So these are sticking out from this little cluster, this little wound cluster. And the nucleosomes, and especially their histone tails, are going to be involved in the regulation of gene expression. What stretches of DNA are going to be exposed to these regulatory molecules that are going to determine when and how they're expressed. So chromatin undergoes changes in packing during the cell cycle. At interphase, some chromatin seems to be organized into a 10 nanometer fiber but much is compacted into a 30 nanometer fiber through folding and looping. Most chromatin is loosely packed in the nucleus during interphase, and as we saw when we looked at the cell cycle, it's going to condense into those chromosome X-like structures prior to mitosis. The loosely packed chromatin is called euchromatin, and during interphase, a few regions of the chromatin, um, the centromeres and telomeres, are going to be highly condensed into a form of chromatin called heterochromatin. So this dense packing of the heterochromatin makes it very difficult for the cell to express any genetic information coded in these regions. It's packed, those regulatory molecules don't have access to their binding sites, and so generally the tighter it's packed, the less likely um, that particular region of DNA is to be um, expressed. And these histones can undergo chemical modifications that result in changes in chromatin condensation. So depending on the signal the cell receives, think back to cell signaling, different regions of the chromosome might be more densely or more loosely packed depending on what genes need to be expressed at any given time. These changes can also have multiple effects on gene expression. Which regions of the DNA do these regulatory molecules have access to physically? So that brings us to the end of this chapter. And uh, we've been looking a lot at this idea of how form follows function. How does the structure of DNA uh, lend itself well to DNA acting as a template for its own replication, the separation of the two strands to create separate molecules. This base pair matching creates a very uh, faithful replication process so that we get high fidelity replication of these DNA strands. The daughters are generally going to exactly match the parental DNA molecules, and it also gives a mechanism for repair and proofreading of these of the accuracy of the replication process. So we've seen how the form of DNA makes it ideally suited for its function in terms of passing on that genetic information to future generations, the transfer of information through time from one generation to the next. So that's remember one of the functions of DNA is the storehouse of all that genetic information to be passed down from one generation to the next. The other function is directing all of the activities of the cell, coding for all of the proteins that are going to make the cell function. So in the next two web lectures, in the next chapter of the book, we're going to again examine how the structure of DNA lends itself extremely well to this function of being an instruction book for forming proteins and how genes are expressed.